Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Man, Ed, this is my desert island book that we're going to dive into here today. But before we do, you have something from Fantagraphics coming up. Full disclosure, man. Fantagraphics is the publisher of the world's greatest cartoonists. And uh, that is true because not only do they publish Dan Klaus comics, but they publish Ed Piscor comics as well. People get mad at that and they're like, does he really believe that? <laughs> <laughs> Red Room, issue one. It's coming out this May, May 2021. As of this recording, it's going to be a monthly comic. And uh, you could reserve your copy at this very minute. Uh, thousands of people have come through the Kayfabe channel and done so. I get a weekly report, Jim. And the numbers are freaking staggering. So hit my link tree up in the description below. Reserve your copy today. Uh, if you have a cool store to support, then they're going to be able to order this sucker at the end of uh, February and every month. I like to imagine the weekly Fanographics uh, meeting and having like sales charts and Eric Reynolds with his pointer <laughs> pointing at different highs and lows. I see, uh, I see what happens on days when we stream and days when we don't and it's, it's incredible stuff. Uh, Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor is where I'm serializing the stories ahead of time. So you could check out uh, the comics. Two issues are up there at this moment. And uh, new pages go up every Tuesday. So all that stuff's in my link tree below. You can find me at patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Uh, lots of behind the scenes stuff, original art and that sort. And I am starting a series where I compare these two comics. This is the Street Angel Lost Dog Story. It was the first image comic that I did with Street Angel when I started publishing with them. And it was the last one that I did for Street Angel Deadly Girl Alive. And started out very traditional, ink on paper, trying to do you know what I think of as digital coloring. Uh, ended up completely redoing it. Rewrote parts of the story, kept parts of the story, and I'm going to go through kind of a director's commentary and do those compare and contrast. So patreon.com slash Jim Rugg to see all of that. But we are here today, Ed, to talk about Dan Klaus. Complete 8-Ball issues number 1 through 18, the box set. Came out a few years ago. And, uh, that's so <laughs> yeah, that's real. I want this issue of eight ball, Dan. Uh, but incredible, right? I mean, like I, I mentioned at the top of the show, this is my desert Island comic for my money. This is about as good as comics get over the course of eight issues or of, of uh, 18 issues because it's all these short stories. There are longer ones that have been collected like velvet glove cast in iron, lots of comedic pieces, different styles, different materials. It's just it's an exceptional series. Absolutely. Uh, make, I discovered it while it was already coming out and discovered it from, yeah, how good is that, right? <laughs> <laughs> discovered it from uh, Wizard Magazine. Uh, that it would be one of the hit, sacred trinity of independent comics that cartoonists would regularly mention when uh, Wizard asked them, what are you reading? What are you reading? It would be hate, Eight Ball Acme Novelty Library. So if you miss it the first time, this is how you get it the second time, uh, second time around. And this is a stunning, stunning object. Like if you're into book design, production, all of those details, this is an absolutely amazing, well done, high quality version. I have all of the single issues still ponied up for this. It's incredible. Like they did a killer job. Funny you mention it, man. I, I was in Seattle doing some, some hip-hop business while they were cobbling this sucker together. And things have changed over time. Like, Dan Klaus would go in, and for collections, he would do paste-ups and patches and stuff to just make the character... He didn't like a drawing of a character. Uh, the Ghost World girls' faces, like, he makes them more consistent over the trade paperback. Uh, and he, so, with the, the original art, like, he's patching up right when i was out there in seattle they were going through the arduous task of st scanning in old comics and trying to repatch the files because they didn't have the the um files digitally with the old images but they wanted this to be as authentic to the individual issues as possible Another uh, consequence of trying to capture that authenticity is paper stock. Yes. Uh, I think there's like a dozen paper stocks that are used in the making of this because there were a dozen paper stocks used over a decade's worth of time when putting the issues together from, from newsprint 
Yeah, I don't know how well that's showing up. If you actually see this in person, I'm holding this up because you can see the different paper stocks from the first several issues as it goes on to like a coded or a better paper. And some of that's talked about. There are some notes in this too that we'll look at. And it talks about some of those, um, the evolution of the series over time, the evolution of the technology of the production of the series over time to the point of, Klaus complaining about various things, maybe on the production end, the printers, different processes, sending the artwork to be shot, and then eventually taking over that duty himself, scanning it and stuff. So the years for this, I think it's uh, 89 to 98. And and that covers some real interesting stuff from the paste up mechanical reproduction to the digital era. And it's reflected in this production. You mentioned all the different paper stocks. Um, one of the first places that you see it, I want to talk about some of that front matter, but it's on, this is issues reprinted in order and uh, different paper stock for the covers, which pain in the ass. I, I don't know how you do it, how much that costs. That's expensive. They went nuts. Yeah. They, they went totally nuts. Like they were, they were uh, sleepless nights, a lot of back end work, a lot of wet proofs. You know, you do something like this uh, and you're communicating to a factory in China yes. to get this thing done. It might not be done right the first time. Going to have to do a little back and forth, man. And I do think that uh, this is the most grueling project uh, that Fanta has ever un undertaken. Um, I know I know it put a lot of wear on everybody. And you know what? We're the benefactors of that. Yes. We benefit from it. Yeah, and there's a reason that you look at Dan Clow's books and they're extraordinary. You know, it's that attention to detail. It's that Chris Ware, you know, another guy who does that where it's, it's got to be the way he wants it to be, and uh, he sat he sat back on this one like he like he you know this is old this is old matter but Fantagraphics wants to do right by him you know I'm sure it passed through him and and all of that but he really took a backseat to trust Eric and the crew to make this thing work uh, and you know they wanted to do right by him and guess what the rest of his books have been printed and published by uh, Fantagraphics after this so what's that tell you. Yeah, so 2015 is your publication date. Volume 1 here has the first 10 issues, uh, probably to keep all of like a velvet glove cast and iron together in one volume. One of the weirdest things, because if you see his collections, like he's doing Indicia by hand, he's doing Table of Contents, uh, you know, you even see a note here from him, hand-lettered, but then you see notes also from him, and they're set... In a, in a font. This was very weird to me, the font choice. You're going you're gonna to set off his OCD, man. I, it surprises me. In, it, it, it's a big surprise. If they reprint this, man, he, watch it be hand lettered now. <laughs> <laughs> um, table of contents is cool. It gives you an overview of what's in each issue. Mentioned this is a one-man anthology for these 18 issues. And, uh, and you'll see it. You know, you'll see it called out with one-pagers and strips, along with the feature stories like A Velvet Glove, Cast and Iron, for example. Pussy is in here, several several installments of Pussy. Yeah, he, and he talked about it and, and sort of thought of it as like, what if, what if one person did an issue of Mad? You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the humor part, but it's one person doing, you know, all four departments, we'll say, worth of uh, comic strips. It's worth the note here. Prior to 8-Ball, I had another comic series from Fantagraphics called Lloyd Llewellyn, which was canceled due to low sales after seven issues in 1987. Overwhelmed by failure, I decided to put everything into one last hopeless non-commercial effort, hoping to finish one or two issues before being expelled from comics forever. I don't know how much of this is kayfabe, because these guys all have characters that they, they do a little bit of this stuff, but I always love this story of this idea of like, he makes a masterpiece whenever he's got nothing left to lose. Yeah. It's like you're at the bottom. It's the same freedom as I won the lottery. I can make whatever I want. When you're at the very bottom and, and your books are canceled for low sales, same deal. You can do whatever you want. You're not making any money off of these books that, that are being canceled because they're not selling. So you can kind of go for it. And he does. I think at least some of that, there's truth in there for sure. Um, I also think that it's interesting, this phrase, uh, I decided to put everything into one last hopeless non-commercial effort. This is fascinating to me because this is opposite of, say, a Marvel DC comic right. or commercial illustration for that matter. But he makes that very clear. This is a, you know, this is non-commercial comics. He's making these for himself and sales are secondary in terms of consideration. Yeah, for sure. Like the Lloyd, whole Lloyd Llewellyn thing, it came from him submitting a Lloyd Llewellyn strip to Fantagraphics, kind of like for feedback. And the 
common wisdom at the time was you got to have have your character and that's what Gary wanted. Uh, I imagine that Klaus had maybe something a little like this in mind, a little anthology to play around with different like because this is not this is Hup. This is you know the great crumb comics uh where he's just doing his own thing and like there's small strips and like there's a history of this kind of thing but at that time you know like they had Usagi Ojimbo and Love and Rockets and so it's like let's get more Lloyd Llewellyn and see so he has to bring back the uh the tried and true at least uh for a little bit there yeah man these are great Jim I I think uh you know like, like we just do a quick broad overview because I think uh, at some point kind of like we're doing the Watchmen coverage it's like maybe pull one of these a month that's pretty good there are these iconic moments though throughout this series and I love this page one of issue one I tracked down these issues over after they had been published and so like you'd get hold of this and open it up and it was just a revelation to see something like that on page one absolutely and it's, it's it is printed so nicely you know this is the uncoded stock again emulating those early issues uh but the reproductions are just fantastic in this throughout. So it really is maybe the best version of this stuff. And, uh, you know, he hits the ground running. Having that Lloyd Llewellyn series pop up first really allows him to learn a lot about production, right. work out some kinks, figure out styles. And uh, Dan Pussy that we that we covered, what a strong issue out of the gate. Absolutely. First installment of his graphic novel, Dan Pussy's in there, and a little Lloyd Llewellyn for the background. And the stuff that's not reprinted is really cool in this collection because so many of these strips have been reprinted in, in one book or another. I always love this because this is something out of, uh, you know, like he has it excerpted from the novel Puss in Boots, 1963, reprinted by permission of the author. As far as I know, that's all that's all bullshit. And uh, this is just him doing like a riff on the paperbacks, which would be like the adult paperback market, adult bookstores. I've gone through collecting phases with that material, and it's so much fun to see like these kind of collection references, influences. Jim, I, w I was submitting stuff to Fantagraphics since I was in high school in the, in the 90s, and I could almost verbatim... Uh, I could almost verbatim uh, spit out the submission guidelines from the site, and it was describing about like the non-commercial attributes of the comics that they publish, like, you know, Blah, 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 love and rockets, blah, 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 hate. And uh, it was the first time I ever saw the term kitsch culture, uh, eight ball. And this issue uh, has has so much. Like, There's that little like Swami guy that's in the bathroom in uh, Velvet Glove. Mm -hmm. That character, like I never asked him this, but if you go see uh, Rock and Roll High School, Clint Howard is this like little guru in the bathroom that guys like line up for and they like ask girl advice and i swear he gets it from that and you know he would do ramon's uh music videos and stuff so you have this stuff uh all, obviously the uh the dan pussy stuff comes from you know weird comics that laugh and spitting man is like you can google that and see it so it was like a real object you know like yeah. like the the storage wars guys like if they see that in a in a storage locker like they'll pay extra to, to get that <laughs> unit uh, he's he's really tied into all this weird stuff, and eight ball became the focus of a lot of that. Those kinds of people, those hunters of yeah. of weird. Yeah, it's a real interesting pre-internet collector kind of the stuff, the pieces that go in here, the influences, sometimes the direct references. I lingered on this just to show off the the ads because another piece that I really love in all of this stuff, and these were hand painted ties. You which could is find those uh, really strange. They're on Flickr. People were showing those off. These a are long great time ago. from Duplex Planet, where it's actual interviews. Duplex Planet was a zine that uh, David Greenberger, who worked in a retirement home, would just publish, and it would be interviews with all these old people, and it'd ask them kind of dumb questions you know what is the most important invention of the 20th century Klaus did a bunch of these so found text but then him just drawing funny cartoon characters loved all that stuff but like the tie piece there were promo pages promo pages and uh letters pages and that's one of those things that doesn't get reprinted if you're not doing a complete reprint and they're amazing like master like, graphic designer when i first started getting into this there's there's one of those references to like uh I don't know, cult culture or something, but prank phone calls. Let's uh, let's get uh, the feds involved in this because I know when you have contests, like there are rules and regulations, and I do think that Jim Blanchard uh, won this contest, <laughs> and he will go into ink uh, 
Fantagraphics books and stuff. So like, uh, I think there might have been a little collusion or whatever. That said, the Jim Blanchard calls are classic calls in the history of prank phone calls. Like you can find videos and stuff uh, kind of highlighting. I forget what they were called. Somebody is going to put it in the comments or whatever, but there are like documentaries about you hit, it's like post Red's tube bar. Man, of love all call. the lettering is always so sharp. And how about this for a murderer's row of letters for uh, response to issue one? Scott McCloud, Peter Bag, R. Crumb. <laughs> Three in a row right there. Like, yeah, man. Wow. That's some range. The bulging mail sack, it was called. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's a good internet piece, man. Like, this guy was called the farting preacher. Like, if you type that into YouTube, you're going to see this dude. Pastor Robert Tilton from his like little infomercials. I mean, uh, his his uh, televangelism, p- going into weird contorted faces and stuff. And Dan Klaus was keyed into him, fucking ten years before Man, he I, showed I, up on the internet. Yeah, having having the uh, the complete access to these kind of issues is really rich. You just see all of this this ephemera that adds up he plugs other things mini comics other creators first sometimes. prize jim blanchard <laughs> seattle washington <laughs> very cool so i'm gonna kind of quickly go through it like you say ed we could you know we could spend lots of episodes on this and hopefully we will i will be in favor of that you can see him trying these different styles too which yeah. makes makes the issues really fun speaks to the anthology qualities of this yeah every strip would look a little differently he would play with a little something else and would uh test himself in different ways like i, th- I think uh, correct me if i'm wrong but uh, would you consider comics making to be like an exercise for you you're testing different materials or storytelling procedures and stuff you really get that um impression when you read these strips like all right i'm gonna try to make a harvey comic quite quite a distance from like a velvet glove cast in iron uh appearing in the same issue so really awesome uh it's great to have a record like this you know more of these pages every issue would have probably about two pages of like ads and letters that would be top notch Art School Confidential. I you know, this it. this is four pages, page 17 tucked into an issue. It, it's it's ingenious. Like, he was just in sync. You know, that's the other thing, is you see a creator just letting go, just going for it, and really at the top of his game. Ink washes. There's a story with, uh, with, with um, Duo Shade in here. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, a little bit of everything. And, uh, There's a Duo Shade piece. A page with duo shade right. for everybody at home to kind of further point out how much he's experimenting. And uh, the nice one of the nice features in here is behind the eight ball. Each of these volumes has relatively short notes on the specific issues, which is nice to read. Sometimes it's talking about materials, it's talking about influences, where different things come from, some further ephemera uh, scattered around. But hearing him talk process, like he was chasing this effect. You know, trying to get very flat covers, colors on his covers, and uh, and he goes into the technical side of how he did that with these like color screens, color zips, man. Yeah, wild stuff. But talking about influences, like, um... and look at the genius here. This is like one of those like little like musician book lectern things. I've been looking for one of these after I saw this image because like you could put your thumbnails there. Like yeah. he's a fucking genius just for that shit, dude. Yeah. Of it's, being it's able really to keep great. your script right in front of your face so you don't have to like look over while you're lettering. It just shaves a little bits of time, man, but compound that over a couple hundred pages, you're saving real, real time. Look how strong his pages are as original art. You know, with the blacks and stuff spotted. Absolutely. Incredible. Got that real Dennis the Menace, Jay North uh, cowlick going on there. <laughs> there it is. And then, again, each issue for the end pages, pulling the logos off of each issues. I love that. I, I This was a big inspiration. Like, I've never done the same Street Angel logo on, on two issues of Street Angel. Uh, because I saw this example and was like, yeah, of course. Experiment play. Kim Lives. Um, dedicated to Kim Thompson, the, the co-publisher of Fanographics, the late Kim Thompson. Nice note in the first one about that. And same format. So table of contents pointing out what is contained in each of these. He changes as a storyteller, I think, throughout this second half of 8-Ball. Yeah. But it's still the format of the one-man anthology and, it, and pointing out the paper upgrade. Like, here we get to see more color paper. Fun story about that. In the back, he talks about getting that because 
Fanagraphics was publishing a porno line of comics. Right. And uh, look at that great ad page. And uh, they would have color. They would have better paper reproduction, all this stuff. And so he was like, well, why, why can't I get that? And, uh, and they were like, okay, you can. And then he had to figure out like what to do and how to work in color and all these different different pieces. Buddy Bradley. Yeah, that little Pete Bag gimmick. Pretty cool. And a few of these stories have never been reprinted, which is interesting. You see this volume, probably the, the common thing being Ghost World running through, I think, all of these issues. Fun to see that in installments. And he talks about the origins of that and how that kind of evolved. Look at those trippy eyes. That should be fun at home looking at it on the screen. <laughs> talks about the origin of things like uh, Ghost World and how that starts as just one story and then, you know, turns into uh, what it turns into. Several stories. Caricatcher talks about some of the origins of that. And he apparently there was a caricaturist that he would go see every year at like a local fair growing up and said that he, he would get a new one done every year so he could sit and talk to this guy for a little bit. Love to see the progression of those. Right. That sounds like a, a pretty cool zine or, or something. Um, so I wanted to point this one out. This is eight ball number 16. And why I say point this out is that this is a ghost world that's run in yellows. Yeah, by accident. Very weird. And I think his note at the back is that he's not even sure why this, how that ran that way. Yeah, but he didn't want it because it shows up blue to mirror all the rest later. Yeah, I wondered if like, well, how would he print this here? I have two copies of 8-Ball number 16. You can see it's faded, but they're both listed in the Indicia as being first printings. So it's right here in both of these. And one is blue and one is yellow. Adding to the mystery, I have no idea, like, what the deal is. Right. They're both first printings, you know? So I don't know if they if they heard about this or saw a little bit of it and said, go back to the blue or what. Um, kind of weird. I found my yellow version of this for a quarter. Yeah, I bet that's the, that's the one that would be worth a couple bucks, man. So, there you go. The modern cartoonist is worth showing too because this would have been a tipped in. This was sta yeah, this was stapled bound, um, you know, through the middle of the book. Right. And this version, I've actually removed mine from the book and then reinstalled it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be a completist, right? right? I was uncomfortable that I might lose it. This is such a cool thing. This should be its own episode, Ed. Oh yeah. I really like this because it's half tongue in cheek. This is that kayfabe thing that I was saying about like character. It's half tongue in cheek, but it's also, you know, like honest right it's, it's talking about comics making and potential of comics and how comics work and stuff a little bit of that like understanding comics and how to draw comics the marvel way you know notes to young cartoonist future and beyond That's cartoonist so great. <laughs> he's <laughs> such his a own. fucking genius <laughs> and even the production of it, it it's made to look like these like industrial pamphlets totally of, of you know the 50s with just ruby lith two, two color one, printing yeah two color printing and, and it's processed red, you know, like it's the cheapest, like most basic. Yeah, this you know, is a, a very fun, cool little document. But uh, I think that's a good solution for not being bound. If this were bound in the in the book, it'd be almost impossible to read this. Totally. So good choice on their part. And uh, if you're picking up this collection or tracking it down, make sure that, that that's included. You, you'd hate to get this and, and miss out on it. Behind the eight ball, again, noting, uh, you know, little bits and pieces about the different issues that are reprinted in here yeah so it's cool to kind of wet the whistle man take a look at the complete eight ball uh if, inform the kayfavers that it exists and that they need to get their hands on it before the kayfave effect takes hold <laughs> track uh, that down you want that on your show that's so <laughs> good it's the, it's the racing team man that perfect mullet that's hilarious there's uh, even a story about the mullets in one of these they they before the term mullet was was created was one of the uh one of the short stories in here and he said that was like some of the most mail that he got a response to. There's also a story it's, about the, uh, there's a sports story in here and it's how sports is metaphor for uh, sex repression. Yeah. Yeah. Like baseball bats, a dick and all this different stuff. And he said that was the one that got the most hate mail. Some paper in Arizona or New Mexico or somewhere had uh, reprinted some stuff from that strip because they were talking about buying a stadium for their local sports team or whatever. And uh, rioting ensued. Like, people were <laughs> furious and enraged over it. So a lot of fun stories like that in here. And I'm the actual stories in here, really the gold that you want. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome, man. What do you say? Good to go? Mm -hmm. Okay, favors. Like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you new vids are available. What you got, Jim? 
patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can find uh, an analysis of my a couple of my Street Angel comics are going up right now, but lots of behind the scenes, original art, um, Street Angel comics, things of that nature. Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Red Room issue one, going to hit the stands May 2021, but you can be pre-ordered right at this moment for, uh, directly from Fantagraphics. Gonna, uh, stores going to be able to order it beginning at the end of uh, February 2021. Uh, link tree in the description below has uh, a link to send you there. Also has a link to send you to pa- my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor, so that you can check out the Red Room comics uh, ahead of time. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with all of this information. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jimmy, give us some more marching orders so we can be on our way. Read more comics. <laughs>